Okay, that Brady Ostrike was the brutal killer. He killed himself a week ago. As well. It was a case that shocked and disturbed West Michigan. The Craigslist murders. <laughs> From a devoted Christian to an evil murderer, this is the story of a man who paid a couple for sex, but instead of the initial agreement, something terrible happened. On the other hand, this was the case of illegal weapons, sex slavery, assault, sexual harassment, and murder. What happened? How did Brady Ostrike turn from being good to a killer? Well, stick around with us as we unveil this tragic case of missing girl found in the most unexpected way. This is Unsolved Files, a place where true crime stories are being brought to your doorstep. What are you waiting for? Just hit the subscribe button for more intriguing and suspense-filled crime stories. Now let's get back into this story and uncover this mystery. Brady Oostrike was the only boy of four children born to Richard and Christine Oostrike in December 1982. He had studied the Bible at the Montana Wilderness School and was quite devoted. Brady, however, worked as an electrical lineman for a nearby Wyoming, Michigan, electric business fixing power lines. He was more than competent at doing housework because he was a licensed professional electrician. Additionally, he had the most exquisite death within his eyes. However, he had a fondness for medieval things medieval, such as Renaissance fairs. Hell yeah, he gathered crossbows and swords. Others thought well of him and still find it difficult to believe Brady committed his numerous heinous crimes. Also. Brady was very helpful to his family and close friends. Everyone agreed that he had always yearned for a wife and kids. Brady was mysterious and sinister to his co-workers and anyone who had the misfortune of coming into contact with him online. Meanwhile, he was characterized as being untidy, not particularly clean, and having a strong body odor that persisted all the time. Brady's twisted tendencies and unsuitable intimate encounters were revealed, even in the moments when he did open up to others. Brady first got to know Tina in 2001 while he was a 19-year-old student at the Montana Wilderness College of the Bible in Augusta, Montana. In his interactions with others, he created a pattern that would remain. Despite Tina's location in Canada, Brady engaged her, and throughout their seven-year engagement, they managed to overcome several obstacles, including the long distance. Naturally, it took a lot of money, Brady's money specifically, to make sure they stayed in touch. The exact amount Brady claimed to have paid for Tina's numerous trips to Michigan and the vacation destinations they visited over the years is unknown, but the $30,000 engagement ring Brady gave her might offer some insight into his financial commitment, if not to Tina and their future together. Not that Tina didn't treasure this piece of jewelry, it was said that she loved it so much that she refused to give it back when she decided to call off the engagement. She did this only a few weeks before the wedding and after the invitations were sent out. After that. Brady told everyone he could find, and who cared to listen to him, that Tina had allegedly cashed out the $401,000 he had granted her access to and drained his bank accounts while he was at work. Even so, Tina subsequently stated that the split was mutual, stating that they intended to call it quits before they were five years into their separation. Brady's close friends and family, however, indicated otherwise, claiming that Tina had blindsided Brady by leaving him. After the breakup, a lot of things changed about Brady. He had made several bad choices. Brady had always seemed to be on the verge of a breakdown. For example, following the removal of a tree that had previously obscured Brady's view of his neighbor's bedroom from his own. Even on a more basic and less direct level, Brady struggled with social skills. His passion for squeezing hands too hard during handshakes led his roommate's father to warn that Brady was going to hurt someone. He became enraged when he thought the neighbor's family was being too loud. Was there a mutual split, or was it one-sided between him and his fiancée? Brady was characterized by those who knew him as a nice, sweet soul, just not very photogenic it seems, and he was one who fell into severe despair following the breakup with his fiancée. Brady's roommates claim he spent most of his free time in front of the computer downstairs, playing role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, which even enhanced his reality. Brady did also participate in role-playing games with groups of kids and adults called LARPing, in which players physically represent fictional characters. He was said to partake in sword fights and pretend battles. He also had a taste for really awful poetry and was completely fascinated with medieval weapons, which were nicely decorated in his house. To make this virtual world real, he needed to do very little more than stretch his imagination into reality. Brady had gone to drink, and according to Trey, the bar manager, he got himself to disclose some deep truths about his desires. He had arrived at the location just after 6 p.m. 
He told Trey how Tina had left him and purportedly stolen his money, and then, over a beer, had begun to chat about women. Brady continued by claiming that women are all insane and that they don't deserve to be treated fairly. He had determined, driven by heartbreak and bitterness and a newfound clarity, that he was done with women like Tina, who didn't want to be treated decently. Brady decided to go after women who desired to be mistreated. And where would Brady look for women of this kind? Of course, Craigslist. The website was in the news a lot between 2011 and 2014 due to the adult services it provided and the fact that some convicted killers had used it to trick their victims. Brady revealed one more unsettling detail when he admitted over a beer at Mulligan's Bar that he was now only looking for women who wanted to be mistreated. Trey's motive for contacting the police following Brady's departure from the event stemmed only from this item of interest, which was apparently of such importance. You see, Brady informed him that he had already found a new girlfriend, who just so happened to be imprisoned in his basement at that same moment. Brady's residence on Taft Avenue was the site of a welfare check by the police following Trey's retrieval of Brady's details from his credit card. Brady chuckled and let the officers inside when they saw him and told him that someone at Mulligan had overheard his chat about a woman being imprisoned in his basement. He claimed that they would be able to verify for themselves in the basement that the young lady in question was safe. After police officers confirmed that Melissa was of legal age and had not been injured, they praised Brady for being so cooperative and departed the residence. However, this was not the entire tale. Nor will Melissa's appearance before the police be concluded. Melissa also wouldn't be the last woman Brady met on Craig's list. She would, however, be the last one to survive. Melissa found herself in the back seat of his car with a bag, which made their relationship a little rough at first. Melissa had spent some time living in New York before returning to her native Michigan. She wanted to socialize and possibly establish relationships similar to friends with benefits. Brady answered Melissa's Craigslist ad within an hour, and they quickly moved their communication off the platform. Melissa disclosed to Brady that she was residing in the next city, Coldwater, with friends. He made the offer for Melissa to move in with him and mentioned that he would be able to visit Coldwater to personally pick her up. Brady had asked Melissa whether she would be cool with her returning with him to Wyoming inside a suitcase before heading out to pick her up at noon. Melissa had accepted his request, assuming this was some sort of fetish ritual. That being said, she thought the request was a little odd, which was probably an understatement of the century. She had jumped inside Brady's black bag when he arrived. After being put in the back seat of Brady's yellow Chevy Cobalt, the two had driven for about two hours when Brady abruptly stopped the vehicle opened the suitcase, and sprayed an unidentified chemical into it and all over Melissa. Meanwhile, Melissa remained within the suitcase which was now situated in Brady's garage. Melissa was still quite sleepy, so what happened next was a little hazy because of the substance that was sprayed on her. She later realized it was computer cleaner. Melissa consented when Brady showed her the terms and conditions of a slave contract, and he then gave her a tour of the house. Things went wrong when they got into the basement where there were two small rooms on the left side of the stairs, connected by the bathroom and the furnace room on the right. Abruptly, Brady locks a thick metal chain around Melissa's neck and presses a gun to her head. Brady's alternating work schedule was the only thing that stopped Melissa from being subjected to repeated horrific assaults throughout the next eight weeks, allowing the master slave contract's house cleaning condition to be satisfied. But Melissa had occasional visits outside of the torture chamber. She had even gone to the Golden Corral and visited Brady's parents, and after only a few weeks of getting to know her, Brady had told his co-workers he was getting married to Melissa. At first, their relationship was hazy, because Melissa gave her assent to some things at different times, like the evening the bar manager called the police after speaking with Brady. When the police discovered her in Brady's basement at the time, they concluded that she was not hurt and left, but that didn't last for long. While Brady's ultimate fantasy of using the taser on Melissa and nights when Melissa slept in the dog cage were both quite real, Melissa blamed a lot of Brady's actions on their agreement. Brady was home when reality struck on June 19, 2014, one early afternoon at his Taft Avenue house. Melissa had waited for him to go to work before calling an ambulance. Thus, Brady wasn't home when it happened. The Wyoming police officer spoke with her about what had transpired between Brady and her in the emergency room of Metro Hospital after she was brought there. Melissa claims that Brady found out she had been in contact with her ex-boyfriend the morning before she reached out for help. Upon discovering this, Brady had her lips split after punching her in the face and twisting her nose. Melissa revealed to the police that Brady had assaulted her before they inquired about previous incidents of this kind. Brady had read her texts a few days prior, and one of them stated that she was leaving him. After giving Melissa a severe beating, Brady threatened to tie her up in the basement. Four days following her escape from the basement to a secure residence, just like Tina, Brady claimed that Melissa had robbed him 
and deserted him while he was at work. Brady also reported Melissa to the police for allegedly stealing his belongings while he was at work. Brady beat her so hard that she decided to end the madness of being a slave, but she chose not to file any charges. However, she wanted the authorities to be aware that his house included kid-friendly items like sippy cups and books. Does Brady have any children? No. So why was he holding on to kid-related items? On July 2, 2014, 18-year-old Brooke Slocum posted on Craigslist, I need $50 by 3.30 p.m. today. I can send it back later tonight, but I need gas and need to clear some mess now. My whole family has bronchitis, and I do not want to get sick. My lungs are all compressed, and I'm eight months pregnant. We would be very grateful if you could assist me and my daughter. Brady Ostrike, going by the username Mike's Heart, found it on Craigslist 10 days later. I can help, what are you thinking, I'm 25, was his response. Brooke frequently posted on Craigslist, demanding money, so Brady ceased that opportunity to respond to her, even though he was 31 years old and not 25. Those who knew Brooke Slocum said that although she frequently used Craigslist to sell sex, it wasn't her decision. Sadly, Brooke's boyfriend Charles pressured her into getting laid to earn money, so she pretended to be someone else and posted to attract attention and get money for sex. However, Brooke, Charles, and Brady made plans to meet at a public park free of police, and Brady even made a commitment to sleep with her for $1.20. But sadly, on July 12, 2014, Brooke Slocum and Charles disappeared without a trace. However, when the police stopped by on July 16, they discovered Charlie's lifeless body. They didn't precisely know what had happened because it was reported that his head had been removed after he was slain, and they didn't find his head. Meanwhile, Brooke remained missing. When the police arrived at Charlie's residence, they discovered a Craigslist conversation between Mike's heart and Brooke. After some hacking and some cyber sleuthing time, they discovered that Brady Oostrike is Mike's heart. After discovering an email connected to Mike's heart, investigators also connected it to another email, and on July 17th, they connected that same email to a Facebook account belonging to Joke Amos, who was also connected to Brady Oostrike. The police then file for a search warrant because they believe she may have been kidnapped. On July 17th, however, they set up a space outside Brady's house as they awaited the search warrant. Thus, they had no idea that Brooke's situation inside Brady's house was not good while they were waiting for the search warrant and parked outside. On July 17th, at about 9 o'clock at night, it had been five days since Brooke and Charles had gone to see Brady. Meanwhile, aware that the cops were keeping an eye on his residence, Brady got into his car and drove off. He needed to get rid of certain stuff after learning from reliable news sources that Charles' body had been discovered, which led to a high-speed chase. Brady's vehicle crashed when he was being pursued by the police in a car. The cops discovered Brady dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound inside his car. Upon opening the luggage in the car's trunk, they discovered the lifeless body of eight-month pregnant Brooke Slocum. She had been murdered and put in the car hours before the police began stalking Brady's house. She had only been alive in his residence for a few days. Ultimately, she had been strangled to death, but her unborn child tragically did not survive. And then the authorities broke into Brady's house, and it was a horrible, horrifying place. In his residence, investigators discovered a sex slave contract, utter objects, swords, sex toys, ropes, restraints, and many guns. Additionally, his home was a complete disaster. He was the epitome of filth, frequently urinating in cups and bottles rather than the bathroom. Everything was disgusting and they discovered films of him sloppily setting up his torture basement. As an electrician by profession, he installed cameras throughout his home and rooms and recorded and wired his everyday activities. A video of him getting ready to meet Brooke and Charlie was shown to them. For five torturous days, he tormented Brooke Slocum, beating her and making her smoke marijuana. How on earth can you make a pregnant woman take marijuana? Come on, bro, that is self-destructive. He forced her to say in one of the recordings that they were merely role-playing in order not to give her the impression that she was being kidnapped, abducted, and held ransom. Uh. During the time of investigation, a neighbor reported that she had heard cries coming from Brady's house in the preceding days, but, however, in the basement, they also discovered a map that had pins on it. The police did state that they were concerned about the map. Since Brady was a lineman and frequently traveled out of state, the FBI was called in to help with the investigation and see whether his online conduct involved any other possible victims. According to a close friend of the murderer, Brady Oostrike, she was called by him while he was doing the crime, possibly even the same day he began holding Brooke Slocum captive, but he pretended everything was fine. Brady's ex-fiancé spoke out the night he killed himself, 
expressing her horror at what he had done and her belief that the man she knew and the man who had done all these evil crimes were two different individuals. It appears that he made some poor decisions within the past year. Brady was scheduled to fly to Vegas the day before the pursuit of his death to see another woman he met on a fetish website. The day before, knowing that she was becoming more serious, he had to cancel it. In 2019, about five years later, the skull of Charles Oppenier was eventually discovered on a secluded farm, approximately a 30-minute drive away. Also, dental records were used to identify it, and it appears that Brady shot Charles in the head before having the head removed. The police have been looking into whether Brady is linked to any other crimes through social media sites ever since this unfortunate incident. However, how it came about is still a mystery. But wait, what made him lose it and act that way? It's difficult to learn much about his early years. Whether the indicators were constant or not is unknown. It seems that after his fiance left him, he had leaped straight into some sort of dream life where he could do whatever he wanted. But even friends who spoke to him over the phone at this time said nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Indeed, he is pure evil from start to finish. We just have to be careful who we talk to online as well as who we meet. But what do you think? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Have you seen a cannibal killer before? Well, check out our previous video, When a Cannibal Killer Spots His Next Meal.